Good morning, everybody. Good morning on this lovely October morning. Thank you for joining us in person and for all those joining us online as well. My name is Iris Lowe and we are Tapestry Monday Park, a community woven in faith. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements before we start our official service today. First off, if you're new here, please, uh, if you're new here with us, please feel free to fill in one of the tap in cards in front of you to get on the mailing list, to get some of the updates that's ongoing at church. Some of the, if you have certain things you would like to be prayed for and cared for or meet with a pastor for coffee, you can do so on that card and put it back in the offering boxes on your way out of the sanctuary. And we also just want to make a note to thank you for your ongoing generous donation. So we have just two community updates today. The first one is the Blue Sky Learning Lab Tutoring and Homework Club. That will be starting up on Mondays again, beginning on October the 21st after Thanksgiving. Registrations will be coming in the coming weeks. And the team would like to have a call up for any volunteers and we are very thankful for the previous years, um, all the teaching volunteers that we have had. So if you can help out and would like to learn a little bit more, you can contact Heather and her email is on the bulletin today. The other big event that's coming up is no, in November, Tapestry Network is turning 20 years old. And we are going to be celebrating the 20th birthday in style in a themed Roaring Twenties events. So get ready to dance the night away at the Italian Cultural Center with live music. There will be delicious foods and a night full of surprises. And of course, the request is to don on your best 1920s attire and to join us for a night of glitz and glamour. So tickets are on sale right now, and if you look at your bulletin, there is a QR code there. So tickets are $60 for adults and $30 for children aged six to 12, and five and under are free. And you can get your tickets from the event, but it's our also for more information here below. One thing I also want to make an announcement for is of our after-service prayer ministry. So we recognize that not everything gets covered during a congregational prayer time, and there might be specific prayers that you would like to be sharing with somebody in private and to be prayed for. So if you would be like to pray for or with, members of our care and prayer team will make themselves available. We've usually been doing it by the piano, um, but we are going to be doing that now in the prayer room. So the prayer room just to the to my right, your left, over there beside the office, members of the care and prayer team will be in in the prayer room beside the office there to pray with you and for you. And all things will be held in confidence. I'd like to ask the worship team to come on up today. It's Mike and his team. Thank you so much for your time uh, for uh, leading our worship with us. And right now, if you're able to, please stand for our call to worship. That will be coming from Psalm 38. And I'll read the verses that says one, and I'll ask the congregation to reply in all. Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. Your arrows have pierced me and your hand has come down on me. My wounds fester and are loathsome because of my sinful folly. I am bowed down and brought very low. All day long I go about mourning. Lord, I wait for you. You will answer, Lord my God. For I said, do not let them gloat or exalt themselves over me when my feet slip. Good morning, Top Monday Park. Today, uh, I don't know if you've read your bulletin yet. Uh, but we are we have a sermon on death and destruction, uh, and this is not we're promoting it. We're definitely not promoting it as a church. We hope we're not promoting that. Uh, 
but it is something that the church should take very seriously. This is something uh, that that exists in our world today. Uh, if you've maybe you've read some news this week, um, maybe even in our own hearts we harbor hate, hatred towards one another, um, and and uh, the blood of the ground spills out. So this is um, probably the the most avant-garde worship set I've ever done, which these guys have already been and heard me sing worship before. Um, yeah. Anyways, so I, I just want to pray, and then we'll we'll start this morning. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, we know that you are the Prince of Peace, uh, that your victory is one that is, that is over death and over destruction. Uh, and would you uh, help us uh, grapple with this this morning, uh, both in song and in word and in spirit. Amen. Amen. Okay, I'll teach you. We've done this once before. We'll try it again. Won't you shine? Won't you shine? Won't you shine? Won't you shine? I've been wrestling with these thoughts about the sorrows of these days. I've been feeling from some time that going the wrong way. How long will it be this way? How long will we feel this pain? We've been living with war, stoking anger with hate. We're taking up sides and looking for who to blame. How long will it be this way? How long will it take for change? Won't you shine? Won't you shine? Looking for the signs, cracks where light shines, the healing of our minds, and all nations reconciled. We will trust in your salvation. We will hope in the coming days. Won't you shine? Won't you shine?
Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and Christ Jesus, our Lord. We gather around as a community to celebrate the Prince of Peace as we greet one another. Why don't you just say hi? I'd like to invite the children to join me up front. I feel like I'm squished here. How's everybody doing this morning? Okay, we're getting a little crowded up here, aren't we? You know, you might not be able to see very well what I have, but you're gonna stay there? Okay, wow. Wow, what a nice crown, Taya. Oh, boy. Well, it's so good to see all of you this morning. We are about to start a new series of lessons in TAP Kids, and it's called Victory. Do you know what 
victory is. What is a victory? Jacob? Right, exactly, a win. So if you've ever won a soccer game or a video game or a contest sometime, then you have had a victory. Isn't that cool? You won a game? What game was it? You can't remember the name? That's okay. You won, right? Oh, that sounds cool. That's awesome. I bet all of you have won something. So all of you have had or experienced a victory. Well, I want you guys to buckle your seatbelt. Do you know how to do that? Can you go like this? So you're in your car, and maybe you're in your car seat, but whatever. And you're going to buckle your seatbelt. Everybody try and buckle your seatbelt. Okay, I see we've got some good buckling going on there. Because nothing is quite as exciting as when God helps his people to win. Oh, a booster seat. That's cool. You still need the buckle. Oh, that's awesome. I put my seatbelt on this morning, too. So we need to buckle up, though, because this is going to be exciting. Um, because stories of God's victory are full of surprises. And God is with people who face battles, and he'll use anything to achieve a victory. Now, I brought a few things. Did you wonder what this was? Hopefully, there's nothing spilling in here. Okay, so this October, we're going to find out what God is going to use, because he'll, he can use anything to get the victory. So I'm going to bring, show you a few things. Okay, so this, do you know what this is? Well, it's not just dirt. It's, it's okay, co kind of. It's actually mud from my mud kitchen that I have in the backyard. So one of our stories uses mud. Some of you might know what that's all about. Okay, now, I went to a river, and this is what I was worried about spilling, and I have water from a river. You can kind of tell. I don't think I'd want to be drinking it, would you? Because it's a little bit murky. But one, this is one of the things that God will use in one of our stories for a victory. River water. Okay, let's see what else do I have. Oh, yes. Okay, this one you might know. A handful of smooth stones. I don't want to give anything away, but that's kind of an easy one. If you might think of it. Five smooth stones. Toby? Oh, you know what? I should have thought of that. I think we might even have one at home. We have a lot of stuff at home. Okay, and one more thing that I brought. Now, you might want to move it aside a little bit because you never know. And I'm going to put this down because you can hear me. And the one last thing that God used in one of his victories was a not a candle, fire. fire. But that's a good guess, because it kind of could be either. Right, fire. So I'm so excited for all of these lessons and see how this could, the things that God will use in our stories. I'm going to leave that there for a moment. Get this. Okay, so those are four things that God is going to use in our stories in October. I'm so excited for that. And you know what? I just want to say a few more things that when God is on your side, there is no reason to worry. We can be strong because God is our strength. God is powerful. And guess what? He is always victorious. He always can get the win. All right. One more thing. Since it is the beginning of a new series, out on the tap kids' table is a take-home paper for the whole series for the parents. Um, I'm going to come around this morning um, to hand them out, and if anyone has questions on how to use them, I would love to talk about it. All right? So that would on the tap kids' table. Okay. We better blow this out before we pray, just in case. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Casey. I think that was a safe, right? Okay, I'm just going to put these back, and then we are going to pray before we go to tap kids. 
yep, there was a bit of smoke. Well, maybe let me pray first, and then you can tell me, okay? Okay, so let's pray together before we go to tap kids. God, thank you that your strength can be our strength. And thank you for the ways that you can use anybody or anything for your victory. Help us to learn more about you this morning and be with the teachers as we teach and lead and care for the children. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. Oh, and hold on there, Jacob. The um, nursery and preschool kids are going to go out the door and downstairs. And if you're in kindergarten to grade five, we're going to go out the same door and we're going to meet in the red room. As we uh, continue on uh, and, and head towards our message this morning, uh, this next song is uh, based off of a historical event uh, where um, uh, during the conflict between Ireland, uh, North Ireland and Ireland, uh, and I, I'm, my history, I'm not a historian by any stretch of the imagination, but um, there is a, a peaceful protest and the, the Protestant um, military open fire on the protesters, uh, and the event was what marked as Bloody Sunday. Uh, if you're familiar with the band U2, uh, they wrote a song about that, uh, and this is a variation of that song. Uh, and so uh, I think, uh, I think uh, we'll, we'll teach the... How long, how long must we sing this song? How long, how long? Okay, that's probably the most repeating uh, piece. You can sit or stand, uh, whatever posture you want to take for this. Um, and then we'll, we'll start at the top and go from there. So. I can't believe the news today Oh, I can't close my eyes and make it go away How long, how long must we sing this song? How long, how long? Broken bottles under children's feet Bodies strewn across the dead end I won't heal the battle call It puts my back up, puts my back up against the wall How long, how long must we sing this song? How long, how long? For tonight, we can be as one Tell me who has won The trenches dug within our hearts And mothers, children, brothers, sisters torn apart How long, how long must we sing this song? How long, how long? Because tonight we can be as one Yeah. 
Fact is fiction and TV reality. And today the millions cry. We eat and drink, well, tomorrow they die. The real battle's just begun. To claim the victory Jesus won. How long, how long must we sing this song? How long, how long? Let me see. Good morning. Let's pray together. Merciful God, the brokenness of the world, the brokenness in our own lives is too much to bear. Creation is bent out of shape. We are bent out of shape. And we continue to bend ourselves and others and the world around us out of shape. We bear the brokenness of the world in our broken bodies, our sick bodies, and our warped emotions and anxieties, our broken relationships. We see the brokenness and the fractures and fault lines between nations and races, men and women, children and parents, creation and creature. We know death and destruction. But as we gather this morning, Father, to reflect on sin and human misery, may it only be in your mercy and grace that we do so. Because just as sin and misery were not the final words over Cain, neither are they the final words over our lives. Your grace to us in Jesus is the definitive truth about us not our sin. In your mercy, you have made it so that our guilt and our failures to walk in your ways do not determine how you see us. They don't determine the final chapter of our own story. Your mercy is the final word over the world's brokenness and misery. And we're gathered here together this morning in part to be reminded of this to be reminded of your mercy and kindness towards us. We're gathered together to encounter the reality of your grace in the midst of your people, even as we might struggle to accept it as true, because it does indeed sound too good to be true. But in your story of making all things new, the things that seem to be too good, too true, too beautiful, are all shown to be simply to be simply more than we're able to imagine. But as the kids in Sunday school are learning, you are, of course, able to do far more than all we can ever hope to ask for or imagine. And all of our hopes hang on this, our hopes of transformation and freedom from our own sin and misery, the same old things that entangle us, our hopes for flourishing life in the midst of a fallen world and fallen people. Because you have, through the power of your spirit, made us alive together with Christ. Gracious God, may we experience as a community just what it looks like here and now to be made alive together with Christ. We pray that you would fill us with your life, that we would live out of your life in us for the sake of the world you love. We ask that you bring your life to bear on us 
as we grow in our recognition of the story we live in. We ask that you bring your life to bear in us, in our own hearts and character, in our families, in our friendships. We ask that you bring your life to bear on Sam and the elders and the leadership team, that they would care for our community out of the love you have for them, and that they would find rest in the same. We pray you would heal those among us who are sick and suffering in all the various ways that we can be sick and suffer, filling them with your life in their darkest moments. Engender in us the kindness and love you yourself have shown to us. And Father, if we are darkened in our understanding, if we struggle to recognize your kindness and love to us in our lives, grant us clarity and patience, attentiveness to your word and your spirit, that we would come to recognize it. And so we ask that you would inflame Sam this morning in the power of your Holy Spirit as he comes to share your word with us and grant us attentive hearts open to hearing from you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So this morning we have uh, two nice long readings. You, I think you can blame, blame me for this one. Our first reading is from Genesis 4, 1 through 16. Adam made love to his wife, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. And later she gave birth to his brother, Abel. Now, Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother, Abel? I don't know, Cain replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land, and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, Not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Our second reading is from Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. 
It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Thank you, Adam, for reading one of my favorite scripture passages, Ephesians chapter 2, and maybe not my most favorite scripture passage in Genesis chapter 4, but we are here today looking and diving into the story of Cain. If you're new here with us, we're continuing our sermon series here at Monday Park called The Story, Making All Things New. It's a series designed to cast a biblical and theological vision for us to live in, to captivate our imaginations, captivating our imaginations with the great and grand story of God from Genesis all the way to Revelation. We're using seven words to anchor the movement of God's story, beginning with creation, fall, promise, Christ, presence, flourish, and consummation. Four weeks ago, we began our series with the story of creation, and last week we moved to the second word that anchors the movement of God's story, the story of the fall, the story of Adam and Eve, the first human pair, the first parents who were tempted by the serpent, deceived by half-truths, found clutching for power to be like God themselves, and as a result, fall from the grace that they enjoy in the garden. Their eyes are opened. They realize their shame, and they end up going into hiding. Fingers are pointed, blame gets shifted, and everything gets cursed. God is no longer loved and served, but rather feared and avoided. Human relationships are no longer harmonious and mutually supportive, but are full of discord and conflict. Genesis 3 is a story of the fall of humanity, our exile from the garden, and the consequences of our sin and rebellion. Now, today we turn to Genesis 4. And what we see in this chapter is how the story of our sin and rebellion goes from bad to worse. We're told of the first sibling rivalry, the first premeditated murder, the first city built, and the first polygamous marriage. Read through this chapter, and you'll see the escalating nature of sin. Sin intensifies It widens in scope. It spreads like wildfire, taking a life of its own, leaving all kinds of human misery in its wake because that is the nature of sin. Sin breeds more sin, and it leads to more and more violence, violence of God's shalom. And its impact goes far beyond me, myself, and I, and reaches all the way to you and to us and to all of the earth. Yes, of course, sin is personal, but it is never private. It always has public consequences, and as we'll see, it ripples through the generations. And it all centers around the story of Cain. Yes, of course, Genesis 4 begins with the two sons of Eve, Cain and Abel. But then the narrative quickly moves to talking about Cain's sin, Cain's wandering, 
Cain's offspring and the city that Cain builds. And by the end of the whole narrative sequence, we meet Lamech, who is the fifth generation of Cain's descendants. He is the great, great, great grandson of Cain. And the person we meet here is someone who boasts about his vengeful violence. And you can hear it in the song that he sings to his two wives. Ada and Zillah, listen to me, wives of Limech, hear my words. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. If Cain was avenged seven times, then Lemek 77 times. It's like Lemek is saying, I will utterly, completely, thoroughly bring my vengeance to bear on anyone who wrongs me. If Cain is avenged seven times, my Vengeance is going to be infinitely more intense and in scope as Cain did. This is a song of Lemech, the descendant of Cain. And what he represents is the progressive entrenchment of sin in the hearts and minds of humanity. Ultimately foreshadowing how sin and rebellion taints and pollutes the way humans even engage the cultural mandate of city making. And we can see this in the story that eventually leads to Babel. When they say, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. Let us build for ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. The tower of Babel, the tower of human hubris and rebellion. Now today we're only focusing on the story of Cain because in many ways the story of Cain and Abel takes us to the heart of the matter. It reveals to us the nature of our humanity and just how hard it is to tame the beast that is called sin. God warns Cain, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you but you must rule over it. You can hear the echoes of our God-given identity as men and women created in the image of God, blessed to be fruitful and to increase in number, to fill the earth and to subdue it. We were meant to be rulers over the fish of the sea, the birds in the sky, over the every living creature that moves on the ground. It's our divine calling. And here in Genesis 4, Sin is crouching at your door, like a lion hiding in the tall grass, ready to pounce and devour your life. Sin is like a beast that is pacing around the perimeter of your house, looking for an opportunity to climb through the back door and have its way in your life. It's hiding in the bushes, ever so present And it may be out of sight, but it is never out of mind. It's always there. Jealousy, envy, gluttony, lust, sloth, wrath, pride, all of it lurking below the surface, circling around our lives, trying to get inside and consume us from the inside out. And if we don't rule over it and master it, sin will rule over us. And we will be its slaves. Sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you. But you must rule over it. See, God is calling forth the best of our nature to do what we were meant to do, to rule over the beastly powers of sin and to bring order to the chaos. But of course, we know how that story ends. Blinded by his own misguided religion, driven by his jealous rage, Cain takes his brother's life and allows sin to rule over him, making him a slave to it, and in the end, Cain becomes more like a beast than he does a man. The story of Cain serves as a mirror for us, teaching us some of the fundamental lessons about the frailty of our own moral lives. First, we learn that token religion is actually a very flimsy place to stand. 
Second, we're shown that confession of sin is the only way out. And third, we're taught to cast ourselves upon the mercy of God. Three lessons. The failure of token religion, the gift of honest confession, and the grace that we find when we cast ourselves upon the mercy of God. That is what we're talking about today. So first, the futility of Cain's tokenized religion, starting in verse 3. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some fruits from the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. Abel was a herdsman, and Cain was a a farmer, Both brothers worked with their hands, cultivating the earth. One worked the lands, and the other raised livestock, and both of them brought their offering to the Lord. Cain bringing some of the harvested fruits, and Abel bringing some of the meat from his livestock. Both bring their gifts before God, but here is where the drama unfolds. The Lord looks with favor on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. And so, angry, and so Cain was angry and his face downcast. The Lord looking with favor on Abel likely meant that Abel was experiencing some kind of blessing. Perhaps his flocks were healthy. They were increasing in number and, and he was likely, you know, generating a lot of wealth for himself. Maybe business was going very well, but Cain, on the other hand, was likely not experiencing blessing. Crops were sparse, harvests were failing, and his personal wealth declining, business was not going so well with him. And he looks over at his brother, Abel, and in comparison sees that he's not doing as well as Abel, his brother, and concludes that God is not blessing him, and so Cain becomes angry, his face downcast. He's raging with fury and hopelessly despondent. Now, friends, is this not a great mirror into our own souls? This story of a brother looking at the blessings of another brother and comparing the results and assessing that he must have got the short end of the stick and responds with bitter jealousy. This is the age-old human response to the occasions when we see others doing better than ourselves and we ask God, what about me? Why aren't you blessing me? You see, we are creatures of comparison and it's so hard not to compare and contrast with what I have compared to what you have and why I don't have as much as you and why I should have more and why aren't I being blessed as much as he is being blessed and why is she being raised up when I am being looked over? It's the tyranny of the human rivalry that comes from the desire of wanting to have more and get more and to be more than my brother or sister. This is a universal story. Now, of course, the pressing question everyone asks of this story is, why did God look with favor on Abel's offering, but not on Cain's? Weren't both brothers worshiping the same God? Weren't they both bringing an offering of their work before God? Was the difference the kind of offering that they brought? Does God somehow favor blood offerings over grain offerings? Is it about the offering itself? And the answer is no. It has nothing to do with the kind of offering that is given, but everything to do with the heart in what's given. And the key is noticing the subtle difference of wording in each of the offerings. You see, Cain brought some of the fruit from his harvest, whereas Abel brought fat portions from his firstborn, the firstborn of his flock. 
The emphasis here is that Abel offered the best parts of the animal, the fat portions, and offered it from the firstborn of the flock. It's ironic, isn't it? A- Abel, the secondborn son, offering the very best from the firstborn of his flock. He came giving his first, his best. Abel's offering was an offering from a heart of love and loyalty and trust. He was offering from a heart of gratitude. But Cain, on the other hand, we're told, brings only some of the fruit from his harvest. And there's no indication that this was from the first fruits of his harvest, meaning Cain, who was, in fact, the firstborn son with all of the social benefits of being the firstborn son, doesn't in the end give any of his first fruits, but rather just his leftovers the stuff that he puts aside after he made sure that he has enough for himself. You see, Cain's offering was an offering that came from a heart of scarcity, a heart that hedges bets and gives God, gives to God based on loveless obligation. Cain was religious, that is for sure. Both brothers were But their religious life came from an entirely different place. And for Cain, his was a tokenized religious life. You see, there are those who relate to God purely in transactional terms. If I give this much of my wallet, if I say this many prayers, if I go to that many church functions, if I give this much of my time, then God will surely bless me. God ought to bless me, God better bless me. See, this is tokenized religion. It's seeing God as a cosmic vending machine where we put our tokens of good works and good deeds, good beliefs, good vibes, so that in the end of the day, the doors of God's vending machine would open up and all the goodness fall onto our laps. And I think this is what I'm suggesting is going on here. Cain relates to God in these transactional ways. And in the end, it provokes Cain to anger. He's furious because God isn't behaving the way Cain believes he should behave. I I put aside some of my harvest for God. Why isn't God blessing me like he's blessing my brother? I brought an offering. God should bless me too. It's interesting that Cain doesn't take this as an opportunity for self-examination, to reevaluate his religiosity and how he relates to God. He doesn't even think for a moment, you know, maybe I'm wrong about this. Maybe I've been going about this entirely backwards. Maybe I have actually something to learn from my younger brother. No, Cain doesn't stop to reflect on any of this, but instead he sees his brother's flourishing life because of his loving devotion and becomes jealous and angry, utterly despondent. Cain's token religion fails him, and it leads him into all kinds of dark places. The first lesson we learn from Cain's failure Tokenized religion is a flimsy place to stand before God. And so distance yourself as far from that kind of worship as you can. Now the second lesson that we learn from Cain's failure is this. Confession is the only way out of the dark places that we inhabit. On multiple occasions, God comes to Cain, giving him a chance, giving him chance after chance to turn things around. Yet every time, all we hear from Cain is silence. And we pick it up in verse 6, when the Lord asks Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, Sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. I don't know how you hear those words, but for me, when I hear these words of God, I see them as gracious and compassionate ways that God is addressing Cain's misdirected religion. 
He tries to reason with him. He appeals to Cain's conscience, turn it around and do what is right, because if you do, then your life will flourish as well. God also warns him about the beast that is sin, that is crouching at your door. He calls out to to Cain's better nature to rule over the beast. But Cain says nothing in response to God. He's silent. There's no wrestling of conscience. There's no inner struggle. There's no pondering his course of action. All of this we have is just silence, which in the end shows us that he's already made up his mind. In verse 8, we're told that Cain invites his brother out to one of the fields that he was probably working on. Abel follows And when no one is looking, he strikes him down and kills him in premeditated fashion. Unable to tame the beast of jealousy and pride, Cain becomes the beast. Like the crouching lion hunting his prey, pouncing at that opportune time. And what makes this scene so troubling is just how cold and premeditated it is. I can imagine Cain saying, hey, Abel, come check out my fields. I can see that God has really blessed you, and you know what? I'm having troubles with my crops. Can you come out here and examine my fields? Maybe ask God to bless me too? And in cold, premeditated fashion, Cain invites his brother out to the field and kills him, Cain becoming beast. Here's a painting of this, a scene, the scene that we're talking about, a painting by the 7th century, 17th century Flemish painter Peter Paul Rubens. It's called Cain Slaying Abel. It was painted in 1609 at the end of the Renaissance period, and you can see some of Rubens' style that echoes Michelangelo, especially the way Cain and Abel are painted. Their bodies are large and muscular and take up most of the painting, and the movements are strong in the scenes. And as you look at this scene, what thoughts and feelings are evoked in you as you see and look at this painting? Words that come to my mind are power, violence, despicable loathing, jealousy gone wild, unbridled anger. Cain's hand is tightly gripped around Abel's neck, his right arm raised with a club in hand, ready to beat Abel dead. Notice Abel's arm held up over his head to protect his face. He struggles to hold himself off the ground, his arm raised, pleading for mercy. I can hear him saying, no, Cain, don't do it. Aren't we brothers? Stop, please don't. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Don't do this. Don't let this be the end of your story. Abel calling out to Cain to stop his madness in many ways is like God calling out to you and to me to stop our madness to wake up and to realize that if we do not tame the beast, then we ourselves would become beasts ourselves. And now we know the end of the story. Cain is deaf to his brother's plea. He's blind to God's intervention for him to stop. And Cain takes his brother's life. Yet even... After the horrific events of this premeditated murder, God comes to Cain and continues to offer him a way out. In verse 9, the Lord asks Cain, where is your brother, Abel? God is not asking Cain because he doesn't know the answer to this question. He's asking Cain because he wants Cain to know the answer. He wants him to acknowledge what he has done. And what does Cain say? I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Those famous words of Cain, 
speaking in response to God's gracious invitation. The first words he speaks to God directly, am I my brother's keeper? Am I supposed to be watching out for him? Isn't it your job to keep him safe and watch him, watch over him? How is it of any of it my concern to know where Abel is and what's become of him? Rather than acknowledging the impact of his actions, Cain is blinded by his own sin. He can't see beyond his own nose, his own concerns, his own self-preservation, and Cain denies, denies, and denies. Twice God com comes to Cain, inviting him to take the way out again and again, and Cain chooses to reject that invitation. And so here's the second lesson that we learn from Cain's failure. That there is no sin so egregious that there is no way out. You see, God always provides a way out. He always gives us an opportunity to turn. He always gives us a space and the place to truly and honestly confess you see, confession is the best way out. Confession is just simply agreeing with what God says is right and wrong. It's saying, yes, yes, I did it. Yes, yes, I've thought it. Yes, yes, I have sinned and done what is evil in my sight. Lord, yes, you are right. Confession is one of the first ways out of the dark places that we go when no one is looking. And now the third lesson we learn from Cain's failure is this. When we finally come to our senses, casting yourself completely on the mercy of God is all that we have to claim. God refuses to let Cain off the hook and calls for his t attention. In verse 10, he says, listen, Cain, listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. I think this is a beautiful picture of God, a God who hears the cries of Cain's victim. He hears the crying that comes up from the ground, the blood that was spilt is heard by God. God hears the cries of the victims and he's calling Cain to account. What have you done, Cain? What have you done? And then we hear the curse that he is marked by. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crop for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Facing his final sentence, Cain is crushed by the penalty of his sin and pleads for the Lord's mercy. My punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer in the earth on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. And what do we see at the end of Cain's story? He throws himself at the mercy of God. Have mercy upon me. This punishment is far too much that I cannot bear it. And what does God do? God shows him mercy. And therein lies the good news we need to hear today. Just as one act of vengeful violence sheds innocent blood and cries out from the earth, so too the shedding of innocent blood on the cross cries out from the ground. For it's in Christ Jesus we see the deeds of Cain fully absorbed in his sacrificial death on the cross. Christ crucified and his shed blood cries out from the ground saying to all of us, you don't have to go the way of Cain anymore. You don't have to have 
this be the end of your story. You don't have to succumb to the beast and become the beast. I have died for you so that you can be free from the beast of sin and live for God and as he intended you to live. You can be set free. And so what do you choose? I want to leave you with this one image before I close in prayer. It's the image of Jesus on the cross being crucified between two criminals. One criminal mocks Jesus and tells him to prove that he is the powerful Messiah. And he tells him to come down from the cross to show his power. And the other criminal pleads with his peer to stop and to turn to Jesus and says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. This criminal praising Jesus, he seeks him. He hears the blood of Christ crying up from the ground and sees the redemption in Christ and he calls out to him. And the question I leave with you this morning is will you follow in the way of Cain or will you follow in the way of Abel who leads you to the foot of the cross? Choose wisely. I want to close with Ephesians chapter 2. Hear these words, this good news for us. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves, it is a gift from God, not by works so that no one can boast, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. May those who have ears to hear, hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Let me pray. Gracious God, we take this moment to pause. We don't often get opportunities in life where we can take a moment to pause and to ponder and to consider our thoughts, our actions, our lives, and how we live it. We're reminded here and there of times that make us think, oh, maybe we need to go another way. But Lord, this moment, this time, we pause and we listen. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Reveal yourself and your truth and your grace to each of us today. Help us to not live the way of Cain and the spirit of Cain, but help us to live humbly before the foot of the cross. Throwing ourselves upon your mercies, trusting that you in your sovereign grace and love welcomes us, heals us, restores us, calls us, renews us, and makes us more and more like you. Come, Holy Spirit, come. 
do your refining work in each of us today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we transition towards the table before us here, we move from death to life and all things reconciled. Feel free to stand or sit and join us in song. Lord be with you. You may be seated if you'd like. 
we gather around this table to celebrate that good news that God is reconciling all things in Christ. Behold, I am making all things new. In Jesus, you and me, we are all being made new. If you love Jesus and long to love him more, gather with us around this table. If you're new here, we have three stations, one to my left, center, and right. We partake by way of intinction, which is that we receive the elements and dip it into the cup. We have gluten-free alternatives at the center with <laughs> that is so real. <laughs> that is so real. Those of you who are online, you're just, you got to be here. <laughs> Let us pray this prayer of confession. We've been talking about this practice, this gift of confession, turning anew to Christ again. Would you join me in praying these words? And after this prayer, there'll be a moment of silence where we can bring our own prayers before God. And so let us pray. Creator God, you made us in your image with a mind to know you and a heart to love you and a will to serve you. But day by day, we fail to grow in your likeness. Your knowing is bright. Our love is inconsistent. Our will is self -serving. Merciful God, we confess that we have missed the mark in our thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart, mind, and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to mend what we are and direct what we shall be so that we may delight in you, walk in your way. Friends, we're going to shift and do something different. This next slide is the words of assurance. And normally it's given from here up front, but I invite us to recite this together for one another. For you, Christ came into the world. For you, Christ died and rose again. All this he did for you to forgive you, heal you, adopt you, and restore you to new life. For if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old life is gone, and the new life has begun. Would you join me in this prayer of thanksgiving? With joy, we praise you, gracious God, for you created heaven and earth, made us in your image, and kept covenant with us even when we fell into sin. We give you thanks for Jesus Christ, our Lord, who by his life, death, and resurrection open to us the way of everlasting life. And so on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was together with his disciples. And after he had taken bread, he gave thanks and he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, this cup is a new covenant poured out for you. This do in remembrance of me. Behold, I am making all things new. For church, whenever we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death and his coming again. Would you join me in proclaiming the mystery of our faith? Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in your glory. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we thank you for these simple gifts of bread and cup signs and symbols that point us to the reality of your goodness and grace and your very person, Jesus Christ, and the gift of your spirit poured out on each of us. And so as we gather around this table, renew and strengthen our faith, let us know you, be known by you, and made to look more like you all the days of our life. 
And so we pray the prayer that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. God makes peace with us through Christ, calls us to be peacemakers. I invite you to stand and turn to as many as you can and say the peace of Christ be with you as we gather around this table of peace. The gifts of God for the people of God. Come, let us eat with glad and sincere hearts. Hungry for Christ. Come.
prepare to turn and face the doors. We're reminded it's Jesus' light uh, that leads our way. And I say, whoa. you to turn and face the doors as a physical reminder that we are people sent out into the world with the love of God, the gospel proclaiming in our life, word, deed. May you receive these words as your benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Nice, nice twirl. That was awesome. That was awesome. <clears throat> sure. Yeah. Uh, they have not. Oh, yeah. They-